Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. I'm your host, Robert Helms, and this is week two of our look at profitable real estate niches, different segments of the real estate market you might consider investing. And today we've got a really interesting and lucrative one, mobile home parks on the Real Estate Guys radio program. All aboard! A few cabins remain for the Real Estate Guys 16th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year are sales legend Tom Hopkins, the authors of Prosper, Chris Martinson and Adam Taggart, sovereign man Simon Black, editor of the Gold Newsletter Brian London, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. Plus, joining us for a sixth Investor Summit, Peter Schiff, and back once again, Robert and Kim Kiyosaki. It all begins April 6th in Fort Lauderdale. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to learn more and reserve your spot. But you better hurry. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Robert and Kim Kiyosaki, and an all-star faculty on the 16th Annual Investors Summit at Sea. Forbes rated Memphis the best cash flow market in the nation. And our good friend Terry Kerr at Mid-South Home Buyers has been the premier turnkey rental property provider in Memphis for over 13 years. With an A-plus rating for the Better Business Bureau, Terry has renovated over 750 houses. Real Estate Guys listeners have snapped up hundreds. Discover what these satisfied investors already know. Mid-South's properties are completely renovated with a one-year warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're affordable, well-managed, and easy to own. Perfect for beginning investors and veterans alike. Get in on the action. Contact Terry and his team via email at midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, co-host financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. We're in a series of shows on different types of asset classes within real estate. Lots of different ways to invest in real estate. Last week, of course, we had Dave Zook on the program, and we talked about self-storage. Really interesting space to be in. This week, we've got another asset class that we haven't talked a whole lot about. We mention it occasionally, but it's really got some compelling reasons you might want to consider mobile home park investing. Yeah, it's it's really been something we've had our eyes on for a long time. And, you know, like any niche, you have to spend some time getting to know the space. And for us, that usually starts with getting to know somebody who knows the space and then having them enlighten us. So we've had a great opportunity to do that. And we're going to be spending some time today with someone who is very experienced in the space. But the reason the space is so interesting right now is because of what's going on in uh, the United States in terms of demographics, uh, in terms of economics, and the need for affordable housing. And yet there's some opportunities being created because of the nature of the product when it largely the installed base came into existence. And as any investment class goes through its life cycle, there's different opportunities. Obviously, in the beginning, you have an opportunity to build things and plant things, and they're new, and that's kind of that expansion phase. And then there's a period of time where they're just kind of sitting there for a little while. And then there's that period of time where they get a little long in the tooth. And so then, you know, what do you do then? And where's the opportunity? Where are we at in the particular cycle? So I'm extremely interested in learning about that today. I have some ideas as an outsider, but when you when you get a chance to test your hypotheses, if you will, with someone who's actually in the space and spending a lot of time in the space, you get a chance to figure out if, if what you think is going on as an outside observer is actually what's going on within the space itself. Well, this is a part of real estate that has a connotation. When you say mobile home, I mean, something jumps to mind, right? And, and, and there's a lot of misnomers in that. Of course, most of them aren't actually mobile. There's really two styles. There's those that are licensed by the local Department of Motor Vehicles. They are licensed vehicles to go down the road. And then there's the permanent installs, but not to get technical about all that. The basic idea is you've got a hybrid tenant. As real estate investors, we're looking for durability of income. We want people to pay us for the use of our asset. That could be a land lease. That could be an apartment building. That could be a single family house. Someone lives in the house and pays you. But at the end of the day, they're a renter. They're a tenant. They might have a security deposit, but as soon as there's a need for them to move, they're gone. A mobile home, as ironic as it sounds, isn't very mobile. And in many cases, the occupant owns the structure you own the land beneath it. So they have a different incentive to pay than the typical tenant. Well, yeah, if you think about it in commercial, it's a holy grail, a triple net lease from a well-qualified tenant. They act like an owner, 
where they, the burden of all the maintenance on the property, all of that's on them. That's great. You own the property, but they act like they own the property because it's triple net. If you look at like some of the way hotels are organized, you have somebody who, who owns the hotel and then you have somebody who operates the hotel. But the operator really has the vested interest in taking care of the property. In this case, you've got somebody who is living in the structure which is the part that depreciates and wears out over time and is sitting on top of the land, which you own, which doesn't deteriorate over time. And so you have them acting like they own the property, the entire property, but they only own the structure that sits on top of the property or the land. And then they're paying you for the use of placing their property, their private property, their, their housing, their structure on your dirt, the land. So it's a it's a great relationship because you get the benefit of the income, but you don't have the same level of hassle, if you will, as the person who is actually having to maintain the structure. Yeah, so true. And now there's lots of ways it can be done. There are several parks around the uh, United States and the world where the homes are owned by the person who owns the park. And it's just like any other rental. And there's also, believe it or not, high-end manufactured housing. I mean, I remember I literally stayed in a mobile home that was worth nearly a million dollars in California, up over the most beautiful view of the ocean, and it was crazy. It was, and it was a nice home. So the connotation is, well, maybe it's it's affordable housing, and a lot of it is. Probably most of it that makes sense for real estate investors is. But you generally don't buy a single plot and put a mobile home on it, although that is certainly possible. We had a gentleman in our syndication mentoring club that did exactly that. But for most people, the real opportunity is finding, as you talked about, Russ, the stage of life of a mobile home park that it makes sense to get in there and be able to make some serious money. Well, yeah, you've got, you know, people that are you actually buying a park. And so, you know, it's you're buying, it's like buying an apartment. It's a multifamily situation. You've got lots of doors, if you will, but you don't own, again, the structures. You own the land or the slip spaces, the spaces they're sitting on. And so the issue that we've got here is a couple things going on that make this an interesting opportunity. One is uh, just demographically and economically in the United States, you have people needing to uh, find more affordable housing. So there is the potential for more demand. On the other side of the coin, you've got a situation where a lot of these parts were built 30, 40, 50 years ago. And the people who own them are ready to do other things with their life. They're ready to exit their positions. And so savvy investors have figured that out and they're starting to move into the space and begin to aggregate these things. And there's an interesting opportunity because when you know that you're getting ready to exit whatever you're owning, you get what's called short timer attitude. All of a sudden, you know, I'm not really looking to optimize this thing in terms of its income potential or fix up the grounds or attract a better quality tenant. There's a lot of things maybe you can do from a value you add perspective that the current owner isn't doing. We call that lazy landlord, lazy owner syndrome. And when you can find an ownership situation like that, you're like, wow, I can come in. I can take this person out of their pain because they've been dealing with this for many, many years and they're done. They're ready to move on. I can take them out and now I can go in there and I can add a lot of value and act like fresh set of eyes and fresh set and make it better for the tenants, make it better for the community and make it better for the investor, me or my group of investors that I brought to the party because I can enhance cash flow operations operations and end up at finding a good return on investment. And you got to know what you're doing. And the gentleman we're about to meet really does. And you're going to be very impressed with the how much he knows about this very space. You're going to learn a lot and maybe find opportunity as we talk about mobile home parks today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Imagine being in the room when some of the smartest experts in the world talk about the future of money and wealth. Now you can. We're bringing together Rich Dad Poor Dad author Robert Kiyosaki, the Creature from Jekyll Island author G. Edward Griffin, Peak Prosperity podcast host and author of The Crash Course, Chris Martinson, plus Peter Schiff, Brian London, Simon Black, and other experts in gold, oil, cryptocurrencies, and real estate to talk about how these all affect you and the future of your money and wealth. When markets change, the prepared profit. If you measure your wealth in U.S. dollars, this is a conference you can't afford to miss. It all happens in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, April 6th and 7th. For details, send an email to future at realestateguysradio.com. The future of money and wealth is changing fast. Are you ready? 
Email future at realestateguysradio.com. That's future at realestateguysradio.com. Are you ready to profit in paradise? Hi, it's Robert Helms. And if you think real estate investing means tenants, toilets, and termites, think again. Located just a short plane ride from the U.S., a virtually untouched paradise awaits. The beautiful country of Belize. When you go to Belize with the Real Estate Guys, you'll spend four fabulous days discovering one of the most intriguing real estate markets I've ever seen. With its jungle rainforests, pristine beaches, and 81-degree turquoise water, Belize is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Plus, it's considered one of the top seven tax havens in the world. Belize property is on the rise, and many experts think the best is yet to come. But don't just take my word for it. Come experience Belize firsthand at our upcoming investor field trip. When you join us, you'll discover the many reasons we love Belize, like tremendously undervalued beachfront land, super low taxes, ease of doing business, and so much more. Get the details at realestateguysradio.com. Just click on events. See paradise for yourself. Click events at realestateguysradio.com, and I'll see you in beautiful Belize. Hi, I'm Robert Kiyosaki, and I encourage you to listen to those wild and crazy real estate guys. They're the best, been working for years, and they know what they're talking about. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this great radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com. So many great ways to invest in real estate, and we're about to meet a gentleman that has figured out a really cool niche. Let's say hello to our good friend, Mr. Andrew Illinois. Hey, Robert. How you doing? Great. How are you, man? Excellent. Good to see you. I think last time we had you on the show, it may have been a Halloween horror story or something like that, so it's been a while, but uh, we've been friends a long time, watched your uh, investing career really uh, take off over the years, and uh, I wanted to get you on the program because for the last several years, you have found a niche, and not only have you found it, you've, you've really figured it out, and, and that's the hard part for real estate investors, right, is there's so many shiny objects. I could invest in commercial. I could invest in agriculture. I could buy apartment buildings. What do I invest in? And a few years back, uh, you really started to get your mind around mobile homes and specifically mobile home parks. So that's an interesting, interesting space. A lot of people hear a lot about it, but I tell you what, I don't run into too many people that are actually doing it. Why mobile homes? So I guess the interesting thing is if you take a step back when, you know, you you were there and, and, and helping mentor me when I was cutting my teeth on single families years and years and years ago, kind of after the market crashed. Yep. Which was looking back in hindsight being 2020, an amazing place to start. And you, you know, you realize that once you get a deal done, you can go and replicate that. And, and that's a, a very scalable model. Yep. So cut to probably about 2013 when I felt that things weren't penciling out for, for me personally at, on the single family front. And, you know, the cap rates were getting a little squashed. Well, you were in some strong markets and you had done well leading up. But then like right. any good market, the prices start to escalate. That's the rents right. don't keep up. And before long, you're like, ooh, returns yeah. aren't as good. More investors jumping in, right? So it all starts to push prices up. We really started to look around for different asset classes, and the first thing was we started looking at multifamily. And Mm -hmm. so 2013, 2014, multifamily started to get really overpriced as well, I mean, probably more so than a lot of other asset classes. So almost immediately that comes off the table, right? And so we're looking at different commercial, and we're looking at really everything that could produce income, and we realized there just wasn't that much out there. And so kind of by default, we ended up at mobile home communities. And that was where we took a really deep dive at that model. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is you think about a mobile home when it goes on those tenants. Well, sometimes and not exactly and maybe a little because there's different models. Sometimes the occupant owns the home and sometimes they don't. Right. Yep. And by the way, mo- the mobile home parks in general, the mobile is the mobile part is very much a misnomer. That's right. right? They're not mobile. They These don't manufactured easily, housing. Yeah. It costs five grand to move these things. You know, a tenant's not going to move this out in the middle of the night on a pickup truck, right? right. But back to your point, it's there's a lot of different ways that these parks can operate. Um, whether it's a rental model, where literally someone's paying a pad rent, which is that's the terminology is pad, right, or lot. And in addition to that, they might be paying a monthly rental for that home. Now, so the investor would not only own the land, but they'd own the homes. They'd own the home, or they'd have a third party financing that somehow. So there are some big operators that are scaling up that way with more of the rental model, or it's like the used car model, where they'll rent that, take the depreciation, and then end up selling it to the the resident down down the line. So there, there are two challenges with that. One is that it's very capital intensive to bring in new homes at forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a pop and rent them at three hundred dollars a month or whatever that is. That's very cost intensive. Right. 
The, the second thing is when you're in a rental model, your residents don't have much skin in the game. They may have a deposit, but it's very much, it's very different than five or 10% down on an, on an owner model. And by the way, in our world, and I mean, this is affordable housing, like very clearly this is affordable housing. So let's say you've got a $300 a month lot rent and you've got another $300 a month for them to own their own home. So at the end of the day, you're kind of in that five to $600 a month range. Um, and in that kind of price point, our big competitors are really like a, a two or three bedroom apartment. Right. Well, think about this. And I guess maybe educate us about this for someone who's listening and thinks, well, you know, $600 a month isn't very much. What do they get for that? What kind of a size of a, of a home is that? Yeah, it's really interesting. So for, for let's just say it's $300 a month for, you know, there's companies out there that Warren Buffett owns that will finance these, right? Yes. So the interesting thing is, the average tenant profiles about their credit scores in the mid fives. They've got eight billion dollars out in loans. This is a company called Twenty First Mortgage with with a five percent default. Okay. Someone puts five to ten percent down on a forty to fifty thousand dollar home, and you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred dollars. So these are three bedroom, two bath. I mean, they're they're really nice, brand new homes. Right. This is one of the interesting things about mobile homes in generally. And the misnomer aside, because most of them don't move around, you know, they aren't really trailers. They're more, as you said, manufactured housing. They're brought to a site uh, mobily, but then there's a lot to put them together and get them leveled and all that kind of stuff. So moving them becomes quite a chore. And so most of them end up spending their life there. But what you get as a occupant of a mobile home, and I say occupant because they're kind of a tenant, but also they can be an owner if they own the home and rent the space or the pad, right. is you get a lot of square footage and a lot of utility for the buck. Yeah. So there, there's, that's a huge part of it of just simply you're living in a smaller home. You know, let's say these things are 1,200 or 1,400 square feet or something like that. I mean, they all range. But one of the biggest things is you don't have shared walls, right? So if you've got $600 a month in your housing allowance, you know, and the big the, the big bullet point here is that 50% of wage earners in the US are making $30,000 a year or less, okay. right? 50% of the wage earners in, in, in America have 600 bucks a week to spend on housing allowance. And so that doesn't get you very much. So if you're going to have the ability to buy a home, which is a pride of ownership, and there's a lot of great things to that, not have shared walls and have your own little, they don't own the lot, but it's their own little yard and they have, you know, a shed or whatever, a porch, right? I mean, all that stuff. So you have, it's it's a little, it's, it's their own home. Well, and let's talk about it from this point of view, because as the investor, if I own a park like that, I like the fact that they had skin in the game. They put some money down, and that was dear money to them. They're paying, and eventually they're going to own the home, and yet get to the point where they own the home, they still have to rent the space from you. That's a motivated tenant. Yeah. Th there's another part which is really interesting. So in the bigger picture, if you were to compare a mobile home community, if you were to picture a 100-space mobile home community to a 100-space apartment building. Right. One big difference where the residents own their own homes in a mobile home park community is that your expense ratio is going to be reduced because we're managing the park, we're managing the infrastructure. Essentially anything below the ground is us, above the ground is the residents. So we're not getting the calls that my door fell off, my my stove doesn't work, my sink doesn't turn on unless it's a water problem, but right? So all the all the things that are within that home, that's all on them because they're, they're the owners. Wow, okay, so this is interesting stuff. So, you know, from time to time, I've come across these kind of deals and it's like, oh look, it's 118 space mobile home park in some town I've never heard of in some state that, uh, that seems like it might work, but right. I've always felt like I don't know enough about that. I don't know what I don't know. So take us through that part of it. As the owner of a park, you're buying real estate and that's fee simple real estate generally. And then what about this, the spaces? Do they have to be subdivided legally or could it be just one parcel? Take us through kind of the ownership part of a mobile home park. Yeah. So basically it's one, you know, it's one transaction that you're acquiring. So let's say you've got a hundred or 112 space community. It's not subdivided up, at least in the model that, that we have. So You've got, um, and it's back to what you had said before, generally once a home is set, it's there for the life of the home. It doesn't mean the resident is there for the life of the home, but that right. home is generally there. It's like in the high, in the 90 percentile range. Because they can sell it, right? They can put it on the market if they own the home. They could if they sell own it, it outright, they can move it if they have the $5,000 to move it, yep. or they can sell it. And usually what happens if they're moving, instead of moving that home, they'll sell it to someone else. I think that, okay. that happens more frequently than... Yeah. 
than moving than actually it, moving it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you go in and you own the park. And now what do you provide? You provide the utilities? Is there security? What are the things that are on your expense side? So it depends on, on the acquisition side, it can be city water, city sewer. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, ways that the billing is set. The tricky part, especially if you're buying one community from a legacy owner, let's say that someone who's been owning, owned that park for 20 or 30 years, and at one point it was 100% occupancy, and now it's 20 years later and it's at 62% occupancy. There's a lot that happens in that time period, right? It could be deferred maintenance. It could be a sewer system that's 30 years old that ha- that's been neglected. It could be uh, putting aside the utilities, which are those usually are, you know, you can figure out ways to bill back the tenants. And, and again, it's affordable housing, so you have to make, at the end of the day, it's all about what the monthly payments are for sure. those folks, right? That's the most important thing. But there's a lot of moving pieces with the older, they're all older parks, by the way. I mean, certainly newer ones, but most of them were built in the in the 60s, some in the 50s. And so when you've got a legacy owner selling it, that's where the due diligence, I mean, you, you start to uncover some stuff. Well, and that's usually not the exception. That's more the rule. Today, the that's folks right. that own mobile hog parks have generally not wanted the secret to get out. They've owned it for 20, 30, 40 years. And most of the folks you buy from are gray hairs that are just at the time of their life where they're like, you know, I'm going to turn this over to somebody else. Right. Absolutely. And so it's either they are having health issues, it's their only asset, it's their retirement, the daughter's stealing. I mean, there's a, there's a host of reasons, but it all falls under operational issues, at least when you pick the right market. Right. Well, and that's part of it because a lot, you know, I've always talked about mobile home parks in the context of being a great land banking opportunity. If you think about when they were developed back, 50s, 60s, 70s, typically it wasn't in downtown. It was in the outskirts of town where land was pretty inexpensive and the tenants that wanted a little more value were willing to drive more. But then in many marketplaces, the town grew around and now they're better locations. And so you've got a a low impact tenant just in terms of what's on the land. They're all one story and they're pretty far apart. And ultimately, the exit strategy might be a different use of the land. Yeah, and I think when you're going into something like that, you can't plan for that sort of an exit. If you're in the path of progress or anything like that, where someone's going to come in and and make you an offer for, you know, take you out with a, with a new project, well, that's great. And just like you said, you've had this cash flowing land bank in the meantime, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't plan on that as a, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that as an exit strategy. Well, no, in fact, it's the opposite. What most of these legacy owners are doing now is they're looking for guys like you who uh, aren't quite as long in the tooth who will come breathe some new life into it. But you know, it's, you know, we talk about lazy landlord syndrome, right? You find a property where it's not well occupied, but if the owner owns it outright and it's 62% occupied, and the rents have gone up over time, they're probably fine. That owner's situation is fine. You come in, and now let's talk about the upside opportunity, because I know a lot of the parks that you find aren't operating at their peak, and that that's one of the things you look at. What are the things that you guys do that can get the parks up to better operating? It's it's similar to multifamily. You come in and you've got you've you've got infrastructure capex first of all. So some of the biggest costs that are associated with buying a mobile home community could be sewer, it could be um, it could be water, it could be roads. Those are a big expense. So putting aside the homes for a second, you've got some pads that need electrical upkeep and things like that. So you've got all of those costs. And then there's the cost of you've got something at 60, let's 60% occupancy. That means you have 40% of non-performing lots. Right. So that could be homes that need to be renovated and then sold to new residents or bringing in brand new homes. And that's really, and, and, and of course, there's under market rents in a lot of these, right? It's the owner, that residents have, have been in there for years. And they're literally, it should be a $300 a month lot rent, but it's $200 a month just because that's the manager just, or the owner just hasn't been dealing with that. That's what it was when they moved in 15 years ago and it's never changed. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely looking for the opportunity to raise the rents eventually, but because it is below market housing or or low income housing, you got to be careful about that. You got to be very careful. So part of the plan when you run, let's say a five year pro forma, you can't come in and just gouge up the rents because you're going to have a mass exit at, at a park, right? So it's, well, we're going to do 5% this year and what, whatever, and you gauge that accordingly. And you may not hit where you're going for five years, but if you're, you know, you're slow and steady and you're making other improvements. And by the way, the biggest thing, and this is like most vat value add plays, if you come in and you don't do anything and you jack up the rents, you're going to have a problem. But if you come in and you're fixing everything up, I mean, we've got a whole plan of actually putting in 
communities and swing sets and barbecue pits and all these things, in addition to bringing in new homes, which adds a lot of value aesthetically and financially. So when residents feel like things are progressing, they're more, no one likes to pay more for their rent, right. but they're they're more likely to to be okay with that. So if they're getting you're, something You're going to get it. less pushback versus you come and just jack up the rents. Right? Sure. Which I think is pretty universal in real estate. I mean, tenants of any kind, if they see that uh, you're doing a good job and you've got uh, these initiatives that are happening, they, they no one no one wants to write that bigger check, but at least they'll they'll see the value. Well, let's talk about it from this point of view. Um, and I don't know the answer to this and and I'm guessing you you guys are in multiple states, but how does tenant landlord law work? with a mobile home because they're kind of a tenant and they're kind of an owner. And as we look as real estate investors, we always want to know, is it tenant landlord law favor the tenant or the landlord? And maybe I'll make a market decision based on that. How does it work with the mobile home park? So it's definitely a little bit different. So the mobile, the manufactured housing, it's a chattel loan. So you, you're basically, if you've got, the, the school of thought is, is if you've got someone paying $300 to, to rent or, or a lease to own on a home, and then you've got a, and then you've got a pad rent, if they can't pay that pad rent, let's say let's say they own their home outright, they're not going to be able to just pick that up and move it because really good chance they don't have five thousand dollars to move that right? right. So it's really state by state by how the process works and the eviction works, but you're basically putting a lien on that home. So it's usually I think it's you know at least the states that we're operating in kind of in the Midwest and the Southeast, maybe it's a ninety day process to get someone out. And of course that's not you know you want to make a deal with someone because sure. some of these folks are a car crash, a car accident, a, a medical payment away from having a really tough time. So you want to be able to work that out. But if someone goes dark and they're just not communicating and you have to do that, then it's actually not a terrible process. Well, and I think the big upside, and maybe we haven't been clear enough about this, is just the performance of these things. Because what really attracts me to the space is the cap rates are crazy good. Yeah, so right now, we're typically buying 8 to 12 caps. We've bought some that are at, been at higher caps, but um, 8 to 12 is pretty standard across the board. And just to break that down, so if we're looking at a portfolio, for example, maybe that's at an 8 or a 9 cap, maybe a 10 cap, and when we're picking up these mom and pop deals where it's one owner who's owned it and it's their only asset, then maybe it's maybe it's a little bit higher. Maybe it's more of a 10 to 12 cap. And how often are those legacy owners willing to maybe carry the financing or stay involved in some way? It's happened, it's happened frequently. And part of the reason is if you go in and, and it goes back to the decline of a community over time and it goes from 100% to 60%, there's a lot that's happened just with morale in that community, right? So you've got deferred, you've got deferred maintenance, you've got all these things um, that some of them you can put a dollar amount to like, oh, it, the roads will cost this much to fix. And uh, another is really, it's a, it's a morale thing, right? So what's been interesting is if a seller, let's say that the, in the seller's mind, the property is worth a million and a half dollars, but really it's worth a million on on in, if you if you comped it out yep. in order to get as close to whatever the seller thinks the value is then sometimes carrying paper is a good option because if you if you run the financing and it makes sense you can sometimes pay them a little bit more because then you have leverage on the on the deal but rarely are you going to get a commercial lender to loan on the acquisition of a park in in a scenario where the occupancy is in like the fifties and sixties, it's it's tough. Yeah. There's some out there. There's there's some floater and bridge products, um, which is you know. But but finding like a Freddie, a Fannie or Freddie product is going to be really tough at that occupancy. All right. Well, we're talking with Andrew Lenoy about uh, mobile home park communities. Is that a way that uh, maybe you can get some higher returns today in a yield starved market? We'll find out more when we get back. Plus, we'll play real estate trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Imagine listening in as two real-world apartment investing experts share their best ideas and strategies. Well, now you can. When you listen to the Old Capital Podcast featuring Michael Becker and Paul Peebles, you'll learn from two seasoned pros who funded and syndicated hundreds of millions of dollars in apartments. Each episode is chock full of expert advice, real world wisdom, and interviews with real life investors. For details about how you can listen to the Old Capital Podcast, send an email to OCP at realestateguysradio.com. When you do, we'll send you Michael Becker's personal due diligence checklist free of charge. Email your request to OCP, Old Capital Podcast, 
at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hi, this is Lawrence Yoon, Chief Economist with National Association of Realtors, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. You can still make it, but you're going to have to hurry to get into the future of money and wealth. It happens April 6th and 7th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. All the details at futureofmoneyandwealth.com. Peter Schiff, Simon Black, Robert and Kim Kiyosaki, Ed Griffin, Brian London, the list goes on and on. If your name's missing, get signed up right away. We're talking about a profitable niche in real estate investing, and that's mobile home parks. Before we get back to our interview with Andrew Lenoy, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia, your chance to win a prize by knowing something about real estate and specifically, you guessed it, mobile homes. Here's how it works. The first person with the right answer to my real estate trivia question gets a prize, and it's a good one. A new book called Life Defining Moments from Bold Thought Leaders. Lots of great folks in this, including the godfather of real estate, Bob Helms. That can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Once you hear the question and think you know the answer or just want to guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address. So if that you're the winner, we can send you out this great book. Last week on The Real Estate Guys, we had Dave Zook on the program, our first week of profitable niches, and we talked about self-storage. We asked this, where in the U.S. will you find the town of Accident? Well, Accident is a town in Garrett County, Maryland in the U.S., the population was 325 at the last census, and according to the book Labels for Locals by Paul Dixon, the town is the only place in the U.S. named Accident, and a person from Accident is called an Accidental. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, what was the price of the average new mobile home purchased last year? Yep, last year, 2017, the average price of a new purchase, not a resale, a new purchase what did folks pay for mobile homes on average? That's a great one to guess on, and you can do that by sending an email to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, your guess, or the answer if you know it, and your mailing address, because if you're the winner, we're going to send you a copy of Life Defining Moments from Bold Thought Leaders. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking about a fascinating segment of investment, and that is mobile home communities. And uh, Andrew Lenoy is with us from Four Peaks Capital. And uh, you guys have been at this for a while. I remember the first couple of parks you looked at, and and they were in places that, uh, you know, you hadn't necessarily spent a lot of time, but you went out and you did tours and so forth. Now, fast forward to today. Talk about your portfolio. Where are you guys invested? How many units? Those kinds of things. Yeah, so we're so we're currently at eleven, just under eleven hundred units, and we're operating in eight states currently, and it's over fifteen communities. Where we found the most traction is really in the Midwest and the into the Southeast. So we don't need to be in a major metro like a Dallas, Texas, but we can't be in a one horse town. So right. we've passed on so many deals where there was a meatpacking plant twenty miles down the down the road, and that was the only job driver. So it doesn't. So again, like. Doesn't have to be a huge metro, but we do need the bit, the, the mid box and the big box, and see where 
unemployment is and look at all of those metrics. Well, it's a good discipline anyway to look at what I always call multiple stories in a marketplace. There has to be not just that single story because if that plant goes out of business, there goes all your rental income, right? Yeah, exactly. But uh, that's that's great. I mean, in a fairly short period of time, you've gone from zero to 1,100 units. That's that's crazy good. I know you got a bunch more in escrow. So now let's talk about this because the thing I've been um, amazed at watching you guys do is to build up a team because you're in eight different states. You've got people on the ground in each one of those places. And then you've got a lot of product you're looking at when you have one of those legacy owners that says, I'm interested in selling. It's not like fax me over the pictures and let me see what it looks like on Google. You, you've you got to go get on the ground and do that. So talk about how you've built the team. So that's probably the biggest part of this, of, of this entire puzzle is these are not easy to operate, right? So, so A, you're in affordable housing, which has its own set of challenges, right? Yep. And B, you're buying distressed assets. And so that has its own set of, of, of challenges. So when we really started looking at the opportunity, we, we realized because we're in so many markets in so many states that there was not an easy button with a property manager. So again, if we're in Dallas, Texas, hey, there's 20 great property managers here, right? And, yep. and line, lined up. But when you're in that many markets, there's not. So you have to build that out. And and I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy having a property management company. But that's part of the that's part of the the scalability of this. Sure. And just as as important, we have a we have a national construction company. So that's a separate company with literally teams of people that go and renovate these renovate these homes. Well, especially in your model, because that's a big part of the value add. The way you can get the value of the park up pretty quickly is to increase the the assets. Right. And so kind of the low hanging fruit for us once we take over something is to go and renovate, you know, using a hundred space park as a as a as as a model. And let's say there are 30 homes that need to be renovated. Well we'll send the crew in to renovate those homes. And then the marketing department takes over because remember we're selling these homes for the right. most part, right? So they're not just a it's not a rental model. So that that takes some time and a team to to execute on that part of it too. And so you have homes that you take over when you buy the park that you're going to renovate and sell. But then also, how do you work with the manufacturers? I know you touched on that because there's financing available that you don't have to provide. That's awesome. But there's these several big names that you might know of these manufacturers, and I'm sure you're cultivating relationships with those folks. Yeah, and actually, so so Clayton Homes is the largest manufacturer. So basically, Buffett got in this space uh, Warren Buffett got in maybe over, I think over 10 years ago, and so he he saw the vision, built out Clayton, which went around and bought all of the manufacturers around the U.S. So now they're they're the biggest with it's 40 or 60 manufacturers in the U.S. And then 21st Mortgage is their kind of the sister company which finances these homes. So they have different products where if you bring in a new home, you've got a, a setup charge. Um, which let's just say it's ten or twelve thousand dollars that you can potentially recoup that once you sell that home to a resident, so you're not buying everything in cash at, at a fifty thousand dollar price point or whatever the, the price point of the, the homes are. Yeah. Okay. And then, how does a resident qualify? Is it the same process as we would if we were buying a house? They're going to consider the rent as part of what they have to pay. The space rent is what they have to pay because uh, these, again, being low income folks. Uh, and then what's that interface like? I mean, is, do you have somebody sit at the park that works for the mortgage company or how does that work? No, that's a great question. So we have to go find that resident. So that's part of our marketing department and their initiative is they find the resident and that's Every way you can imagine, right? It's it's print ads, it's it's social media, it's it's all the above. And once we find a resident um, who checks our our application, you know, process, then we send them to our lender, knowing that I mean, the average the average credit score in twenty first mortgage is in the mid fives, yeah. right? So they're looking at things like, have you made your rent payment on time for the last five years. I don't care about your bankruptcy six years ago. Right. Do you have a job and can you and have can you pay your rent? I mean that's what they're that's what they're looking for. Sure. Well makes sense. Again, you gotta get your mind around this is a different market than maybe you're used to, but the numbers are, are pretty impressive looking at what you guys offer. In fact, let's talk about that because uh, certainly you are able to work with people that come in and say, yeah, I'd love to buy my own community. But mostly what you've done is transition to this model where you're syndicating, raising money to go do these deals and you can take down bigger deals and in fact, portfolios. You find some of these guys that have acquired two, three, four sets of, of, of uh, communities. That's a hard thing to sell, especially in their different states, but not to a buyer like you. Yeah, and it's... it's 
I guess it's like most other parts of the real estate business, it's all about relationships, right? So we've got great relationships with brokers now than when we first started. So we're actually seeing some good off-market deals, um, you know, the, the, the pocket listings where those aren't getting pushed out to the general public. And if they are, we still, we've got these great relationships that help kind of steer those deals. Sure. Well, I mean, that makes sense. You guys have proven that you can perform, you know, the space versus someone who say listens to a podcast and goes on LoopNet and says, oh, here's a mobile home park. I'm going to make an offer. I mean, if you're the seller, you want to make sure that whoever's going to take it over, especially if they're caring anyway, is someone that's going to get the job done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about that side of it, which is the passive investing. We have someone listening who says, this sounds like a great space. I get why this makes sense. I don't want to have to fly to some state and figure it out. Can I come alongside you? What does that look like? How do you set up these investment opportunities for people? Yeah, it's funny because the, the I guess the history of this is we, we had fewer partners that were in from the beginning. Maybe it was one or two partners and that grew and basically grew at, uh, based on the response of our investors that were saying a lot of it's market driven, right? Like everyone's looking for yield. It's everything's a lot of things are overpriced right now, but the, but the cap rates are still strong in this. So because of that, we're, we're able to, in our investments, provide pretty stable income and some great upside. So it's almost like a hybrid of, of income and growth. Because typically the park is going to have occupancy. And even if it's low occupancy, which you're actually after, so you can increase that, those occupancies run a pretty decent cash flow. So look, having looked at some of your executive summaries, I mean, virtually from day one, they're cash flowing. And your mission is through what the knowledge you've acquired and the team that you've built to be able to continue to crank up those dials and, and get those numbers up and just becomes a cash cow. Yeah, absolutely. So if we've got a model where there's a preferred return to the investor, that dictates what we need to go find on the acquisition side. Because, I mean, there, there are great deals that are sub-20% occupancy, but that's a different model, right? right? It's almost like go put the shovel in the dirt and go build your own because you're not going to see cash flow for years, right? right? And I've seen some of these that that they're part of what they're touting is, hey, we've got, you know, 24 spaces, but we we could add more. And my my question is always, well, why, did, why haven't you, right. right, if you could? But part of that is market-driven, and so sometimes they just need a fresh look at it. Well, this is fascinating stuff, and uh, we did uh, what we normally do in these situations. We asked you guys to come up with a report, which you've done, and we'll tell listeners how they can get that. You're going to learn the nuts and bolts of, uh, of investing in this uh, kind of a space. Tell us about the, uh, the report that you put together. Yeah, a lot of it, some some of it we've touched on already, but it's really, it's a it's a pretty detailed overview on why we're, we're bullish on affordable housing A and B mobile home communities, because that's really, that's that's what we're laser focused on right now. So it's a good overview on, we, you know, we feel it's a pretty overlooked asset class and niche, right? So a lot of people are, are starting to talk about it now, but it's still pretty considered pretty um, pretty niche. Well, absolutely. And I know there's a lot of folks that are interested, but it's hard to get your mind around and it is a little harder work. It's like C-class apartments. They're not for everybody. Once you figure out how to get, operate those and you have the right relationships, that can be a more lucrative space than the guys that, you know, buy A-class because they're looking for a very small, predictable yield. Here there is some up and down, but you also have that kind of base level of cash flow. It makes it really interesting that rather than just buying a, a rehab and having it to completely rely on the market, you've got tenants who are at the low end. And I think another part of that is a lot of folks that, that we listen to and pay attention to are concerned that we're pretty long in this cycle and, hey, if there's something coming, if there's difficult times, this is one of the asset classes that performs very well. It's a contrarian asset class. Yeah, and we've got some interesting data on that as well. And it's funny, my, my, my partner, Mike, who's owned communities since 2006, and also one of our brokers who's owned communities, one of the first questions I asked both was, well, what happened? What happened in the downturn, right? And then the, the answer is not very much. Right. Some, some did better, some did about the same. But and all the data that we've seen is is during that correction, there wasn't even a dip, right? It's just always been slow and steady. You could argue that about affordable housing, but it's specifically for this asset class that was the case. Yeah, interesting stuff. All right, so if you want to get a copy of Andrew's report, stick around. We're going to tell you how you can do that. It's free, and you'll learn a bunch of stuff about it. Um, what do people need to know who are thinking, hey, this might be a good investment for me, the pros, the cons, the you know eyes wide open, if you will. Yeah, I think it's like any other asset class is spend the time, spend the due diligence on your end upfront on 
on the asset class, especially if you're not that familiar with affordable housing. If you are, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a natural extension to learn about this, but really there's a lot of moving pieces in this model, right? If you've got homes you're selling and renovating, it's not just buying an apartment building and renovating and then renting units. There's, there's some more moving pieces. So it's really get your, get your mind around that, that process. And of course, always do your due diligence on, on an operator, right? That's always, that's always huge as well. Yeah, you bet. All right, good stuff. Well, we appreciate you uh, sharing with us today. And then we come back, we'll tell you how to get a copy of this report. So you can learn more about mobile home park investing. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Robert. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. This portion of the Real Estate Guys radio program is brought to you by International Coffee Farms, where you can own a parcel of land in your very own specialty coffee farm in Panama for as little as $15,000. Here's how it works. Deeded half-acre parcels entitled Specialty Coffee Farms in Boquete, Panama are turnkey managed professionally on your behalf by a team of local experts. Sustainable average income is estimated at 12% and cash flow can begin within 12 to 15 months from the date of your parcel ownership. International Coffee Farms' mission is to own and operate specialty coffee farms that are economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable. As part of this mission, 20% of the gross profits of each farm is committed to a socially sustainable fund to improve the lives of the Panamanian coffee farm workers and their families. International Coffee Farms currently owns and operates nine specialty coffee farms with half-acre parcels available for immediate ownership. To find out how you can become a coffee farm owner in Paquete, Panama, email coffee at realestateguysradio.com. That's coffee at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Patrick Donahoe, CEO of Paradigm Life. Wall Street and banks spend billions of dollars per year in advertising with the goal to convince you that they are the solution. But take a look around. None of their advice has worked. If you're listening to this, odds are pretty good that you're already a real estate investor or at least becoming one. So why do you do it? Is it to hedge inflation, the tax benefits, or maybe it's to get your money away from Wall Street? It's because of these benefits and so many more that I created the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy. When you combine successful real estate investing with the Perpetual Wealth Strategy, you have the recipe for what has helped the wealthy to establish their financial well-being for decades. You can download the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy today by clicking the Resources tab on the Real Estate Guys Radio homepage. Don't wait. Go download it now. Hey, this is Phil Collin from Def Leppard and Delta D. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio show. Oh my gosh, a ton of information about mobile homes and mobile home parks from Andrew Lenoy. Well, this is, this is the reason why we want to go talk to people that are like neck deep in their niche, that yes. are experts, because they just have tactical knowledge. They have industry knowledge and insights. Sometimes you come along and you make assumptions as an outsider about the way things work, you know, like, oh, this would be an ideal land banking play. And then you dig deeper and find out, yes, but there are some technicalities, you know, and, and there's just different things. So, you know, always learn a lot when we talk to people, but I think the highlight is really just understanding how important it is that if you choose to invest in a space, either you're going to commit yourself to becoming the expert or you're going to commit yourself to finding the expert and then investing in and through them. You know, one of the interesting things is that Andrew talks about building his team, right? Very critical. And this is a lot of hands-on work that has to be done. We actually had a chance to spend some time after the interview with Andrew with his partner, who is totally hands-on, independent of their company together. Prior to that, his partner, Mike, hands-on mobile home park owner who really gets what it takes to make one of these things sing. Well, it's like any business. If you run a company at any level, if you own a grocery store, the money gets made really uh, at the ground level. Who's waiting on the customer? Who is uh, helping them with their order? Who's taking their money? Who's stocking the merchandise? Who's making those tactical decisions? And the devil's always in the details. And so operations is really, really important. So, you know, people think, oh, I'm just going to buy this apartment building, or I'm going to buy this mobile home park, or I'm going to buy this whatever, and I'm just going to own it, and it's going to throw off cash. 
Well, yeah, it will, as long as somebody is minding all the details. And that's where the operating part of it comes into uh, to deep account. Yeah, and you know what the big picture is, the returns are fabulous on these, but there's a lot of work. It's not a passive investment for most folks. Of course, Andrew and Mike and their team have figured out a way that you could make it passive if you wanted to. So if you're interested in finding out what they do and a little more information about this space, just send an email to mobilehomes at realestateguysradio.com, mobilehomes at realestateguysradio.com, and you'll get the information. Big thanks to Andrew for sharing it with us today. Hey, some time still remains for you to get a ticket to the future of money and wealth. It's going to be incredible. If you've noticed that there's been volatility in the stock market or gold or oil or Bitcoin or any of that, you want to figure out what's going on. We've got the most amazing faculty and we'd love to have you at this event. You know, we really do. Every year we go off to the Investor Summit at Sea and we get together with this amazing brain trust and we spend all this time looking at what's going on in the world and how do we play it? Where are the opportunities going to be? And not everybody can get on the ship and we understand that. And so we've get, got this opportunity now to share the bulk of the Summit at Sea faculty for two full days on land in a hotel conference center talking about what is going on in the world of money and banking and currencies and what does the future really look like? Because there is going to be some change. There's already been some change going on. And the question is, is how is that going to affect me as a street level investor? And so the, the way we're going to organize this, which I'm so excited about, is we're going to have these big level thinkers, these thought leaders, these best selling authors are going to be coming and they're going to say, this is what I see in currency. This is what I see in metal. This is what I see in the dollar. This is what I see in Fed policy. Brand new Fed chair. We got Tom Wheelwright coming, talking about the tax reform. What's going on in the tax reform? Where are the opportunities? Where are the potential problems? And so they're going to lay all that out. And then we're going to bring in a whole group of people that are niche investors, that are investing in multifamily real estate, single family real estate, residential assisted living, land, all these different investors. And they're going to sit at and they're going to say, okay, based on what I just heard, how am I going to invest? What am I going to do? Because knowing what's going on is interesting. Being aware of a problem or opportunity is interesting. But ultimately, how do you apply that knowledge to effective action? Well, we're going to be talking about that at the Future of Money and Wealth. Well, and because it's two full days, plus a fun reception the night in between, you're going to have a chance to meet other investors from all over the place, find out what they're doing, what was their take on the ideas. You're going to get to make great connections, and you're going to leave with actionable items that you can make sure in the next 6, 12 18 months, you are on the right side of change. Yeah, and, and the thing is, uh, because we think it's so important, it's probably the least expensive two-day seminar that we have done in quite some time. So and it could arguably be the most expensive. It should be thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's not because we do not want the price to be a barrier to entry. No, people need this information. And that's the point. And we don't want to sound doom and gloom because we don't consider it to be doom and gloom at all. I mean, I remember sitting with uh, Peter Schiff and, and Robert Kiyosaki and Simon Black in 2013 talking about Bitcoin. You know, and so what's an idea worth? Right. You know, I mean, you get a good idea from a smart person and you just act on it. You know, it can change your entire life. And so we're not saying that's going to happen for you, but pretty sure if you're not there, it probably won't. Yeah. So this is about getting great people together in a room for a couple of days and focusing on a hot, hot topic and then walking away with actionable intelligence. Get all the details at our website, realestateguysradio.com under events. Big thanks to Andrew Lenoy for his big brain on mobile home parks today. If you want to find out more, send an email to mobile homes at realestateguysradio.com. Next week, we'll talk about another real estate asset class. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki, and I'm very excited that I'll be joining the real estate guys for their investor real estate summit at sea. Join me, join my friends, join the real estate guys investor summit at sea, and I'll see you out there. Thank you very much. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life, Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. 
Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.